In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Anyone who hears these words of the Lord Jesus in that original context, where he speaks about God giving the light and about not covering it up. There's no one could have failed to think of that phrase from the prophets of Israel that they were to be a light unto the nations. Or that goyi, a light unto the nations. This, of course, goes right back to the first call of Abraham when he was promised that through him and through his descendants, not just he and his family, not just he and those who would come after him, but the whole world, all the nations of the world would be blessed. But that phrase, or la goyim, comes to the fore most in the prophet Isaiah. At that time of exile in Babylon, the last section of Isaiah, those words of comfort, which are given to the people which had been taken away from their land, stripped of worship in their temple, and their king taken away from the words of comfort from the prophet Isaiah are that nevertheless Israel is to be a light unto the nations. In chapter 42 of Isaiah, the Lord says, I am the Lord. And I call you into my righteousness. I will take you by the hand. And I will make you a light unto the nations. In chapter 49, in this beautiful episode, when the prophet Isaiah is despairing, when he thinks, what's the point of everything that I am doing? The Lord says to him, it's yet too little a thing for you simply to be my servant. For you to establish the tribes of Jacob, or to restore the sons of Israel. Rather, you must go and be a light unto all the nations, and bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. There's the full vocation. Or indeed, in chapter 60, that glorious chapter which describes the restoration of all things, the messianic age when God's glory will reign over all the earth. Isaiah writes in the words of the Lord himself that Israel will be the place unto which all the nations walk and the kings will be drawn by the brightness of their rising. Hand in hand with being God's covenant people is an expectation that that blessing isn't kept for oneself or simply hoarded, covered up, but rather is to be a light unto the whole world. Now I set all this in this context from this morning's gospel because what I really want us to look at is this very difficult passage from 2 Corinthians that we read in this morning's epistle. And that passage is one that has led to all manner of difficulty. Because it's in this passage where seemingly, and this is historically how this has been understood, St. Paul is contrasting two ways of reading the scriptures. Two ways of understanding God's word. On the one hand, there's the way that is the letter. The letter which kills he says in an early set, earlier part of that chapter that we read from this morning. And on the other hand, there's the Spirit. The Spirit by which God writes His covenant in flesh, in hearts. And His Spirit is active, and that covenant is lived out. Now the, that is all fine, but the difficulty is in this reference to Exodus. Specifically, Exodus chapter 34, when having spent some 40 days on the mountain, on Mount Sinai, Moses returns to the people of Israel at the bottom of the mountain, 
having spent time with God in God's presence, having received God's glory, his light, into himself, and experienced that Moses comes down, and his face shines so brightly that he needs to veil himself. He needs to cover his face with a veil. Just as a point of trivia, the word in Latin for that glory, that shining brightness, is very close to the word for horns. And it got mistranslated in the Latin as horns. And you'll find in many a picture from the Middle Ages and beyond of Moses coming down from the mountain depicted with horns. If you were recently at the Chagall exhibition across the road here, somewhat ironically, even Mark Chagall, a Jew, depicts Moses in that same way, the horned Moses, but it's to represent that glory, that brightness that was that the people were unable to receive, so Moses puts a veil over his And this is the, the image that St. Paul is playing with. And the difficulty in this passage is that he says, until this day, those who don't hear, and by implication, we think, we interpret historically this has been the case, we think the Jews. The Jews read the Old Testament with a veil over their faces. They're unable to understand what's going on. But those who know the Lord, who like Moses saw the Lord face to face, they see without the veil. They, they become mirrors to God's glory, reflecting that light into the world. They are therefore, or my boy, light unto the nation. Historically, this has been used to justify the worst kinds of supersession, of substitution, that where the Jews were once God's chosen people, now in place of them are something called Christians. Christianity, now God's new chosen people, the Gentiles replacing the Jews, the, those who see by the Spirit in an unveiled way, replacing those who are veiled. And again, throughout the Middle Ages, you think of the art that depicts this, the synagogue depicted as a woman with her head veiled, her eyes blinded, and the church depicted with eyes open to God's truth. Again and again, this has been hammered home. But is this what St. Paul is talking about? Is this what he's referring to when he references this light unto the nations, the glory of God reflected in those who live by God's Spirit, not by the letter? It's important to do the interpretation here in the way that St. Paul himself is doing. It's the method of Midrash. And Midrash is a way of interpreting the scriptures in a way that gives importance to the concrete details of the story. And I say that because it is principally our way of interpreting, but sometimes as Christians we lose sight of the original historical story. We rush to the typological, the spiritual, symbolic meanings of things. Oh yes, Moses, the veil. Yes, we can apply that. The synagogue is veiled. The church is unveiled. Job done. But if you look at the concrete details of the story, who is it that received the glory of God and shone with that brightness? It's Moses. It's Moses, not the church, not Christians. There's no way, shape, or form we can construe Moses as prophet as a kind of proto-Christian, opposing him to Israel. The point is that people who are hard of heart, those who Moses found at the bottom of the mountain, and of course his brother and the people have been busy doing what? Melting down the gold of Egypt and making a golden calf and calling that Yahweh. This is the God that brought us out of Egypt. The hardness of their hearts is at issue not the truth of the covenant of Israel represented by Moses. That's what St. Paul is addressing here in this passage. 
And it's no accident that our Lord's own words in this gospel come right after the parable of the sower, the parable of the four soils, about those who are or are not able to receive God's glory, His word, those who are or are not capable, capacitated to bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. And it's our Lord's warning that you should not cover up that which you've received, that you should not have the hardness of heart to reject what has been planted in you, but you should thrive. And St. Paul, in his letter, second letter to the Corinthians, is chapter 3, St. Paul is not contrasting the dead letter of Moses with the new spirit of the gospel. It's all of one thing. He's contrasting those who do or do not receive. But many a Christian historically has built upon this framework and has contrasted law with grace, letter with spirit, and simply concluded Judaism, the whole tradition from which our Lord emerged, the whole tradition from which St. Paul himself is operating as the Pharisee of the Pharisees, he calls himself, is somehow that dead letter, that legalism, that absence of grace. The warning here is for all time that we should not cover up that which we receive. We should not reject what God is planting in our midst. As an extension of this, the danger, of course, is that we have contrasted through the last 2,000 years the Christian interpretation of these things with what we view to be the Jewish one. There are two different ways of interpreting what it means to be or Adoyim, the light unto the nations. Two different approaches, which indeed have predominated in both of those covenant traditions both of those traditions of peoples who follow the God of Israel. Of Israel. The Jewish scholar Daniel Boyarin, in his book, The Radical Jew, about St. Paul and about this passage, clarifies for us what those approaches are. And each of them, he says, has a genius, but each of them has a dark side. The genius of the Christian approach to the light unto the nations, or la goyim, is the universality of the message. The genius of the Christian approach is to say, this belongs always and everywhere now to all peoples. All are called to share in this light and to reflect this light. All are called to receive the gospel. Daniel Boyarin says, by contrast, the Jewish approach to Or La Goyim is about this, the particularity, the specialness of being God's chosen people and the extra responsibility which they carry. The expectation specifically in being Torah observant to keep the 613 precepts of the law. But the genius of that is that it's not expected of all the nations. The same requirement is not made of all. But rather, as God's covenant people, there is a responsibility to keep that law in order to model and to show by this angle here of God's glory to all the world. The genius of that is that it leaves other people alone, whilst allowing them to share in God's final promises. The dark side of each of those, though, that in the Christian approach is this universality can lead to domination, to going towards the other always with the sense that my life must eclipse yours, that I must somehow trample over you in order to make this universal message possible. The dark side of the Jewish approach is that the leaving others alone can lead to indifference, Boyarin says. I think what St. Paul would have us do is hold both these traditions together. If we are truly 
to offer or la goyim, light unto the nations. It must both be the message for all, but also proclaimed in such a way that we take responsibility ourselves for not covering that up, for not being hard of heart, for not allowing that seed to take root and to grow fruit in us. I think a perfect example in our own Orthodox tradition of this is St. Seraphim of Sarah, who says to us the most important thing in the Christian life is to acquire the Holy Spirit as fully as possible. And if we are saved, then thousands around us will be saved. There's that perfect balance between Christian universalism and Jewish understanding of the life of the nations being a particular mission to model that to others, not to impose or dominate others through it. As I say, the dark side, especially of the Christian one, has been all too apparent over the last 2,000 years. And Jews themselves have especially borne that in their own bodies, in the ways that Christians have lived that out. So dear brothers and sisters, as we are reminded this day, both by our Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel, but by St. Paul too, in this epistle to the Corinthians, of the importance within God's covenant, life and family of Or La Goyim, the light unto the nations, let us bring together both of these traditions and live that out in such a way that we truly can be as St. Paul enjoins us to be, those who, like a mirror, reflect God's brightness and glory to all the world.